Merhaba sevgili Sol TV izleyicileri. Bugün dünyanın politikasında konumuz Filistin. Bildiğiniz gibi Filistin'de gerginlik kısa bir süre önce yeniden yükseldi. Ee, İsrail güvenlik güçleri Mescid-i Aksa'da toplanan Filistinlilere saldırdılar önce. Bu saldırılar başka yerlerde de gerçekleşti. Ee, ayrıca İsrail'in Filistin topraklarını ilhak etme politikası kapsamında e, Doğu Kudüs'ün Şeyh Cerrah Mahallesi'nde yaşayan Filistinlilerin evleri e, ne terk etmeye zorlandı Filistinliler. Bu tür baskılar arttı. E, daha sonra Gazze'den bazı İsrail kentlerine füze saldırıları gerçekleşti. E, buna, bunun karşılığında İsrail önce Gazze'ye çok şiddetli saldırılar düzenledi. E, yalnızca Gazze'de çok sayıda çocuk dahil 200 aşkın Filistinli yaşamını yitirdi. Çok sayıda bina yıkıldı. Bazı sağlık kuruluşları dahil ülkenin altyapısı büyük zarar gördü. Ardından iki taraf arasında bir ateşkes yürürlüğe girdi. Ee, bugün bu konuyu konuşacağız. Konuğumuz İsrail'den. Ofer Kasif, e, İsrail Komünist Partisi Merkez Komitesi üyesi. Bu partinin öncülük ettiği Hadaş Cephesi'nin İsrail Meclisi Knesset'teki üyelerinden biri. E, aynı zamanda siyasal felsefe alanında çalışma olan bir akademisyen kendisi. E, şimdi ben kendisine dönmek istiyorum ve e, sorularımı yöneltmek istiyorum. Hello, Ofer. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today. Um, I'd like to start. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to start by asking why all this is happening. Uh, why, in the beginning, the Israeli security forces attacked the people in uh, Al Aqsa? Uh, is this related to the situation regarding the internal politics of Israel? Uh, because after the fourth elections in the space of two years. Uh, still a government cannot be formed and this time Netanyahu is having more difficulties. Can he be trying to have a stronger position by increasing the aggression against the Palestinians? Uh, I guess he gave the answer within the question, but I will elaborate upon that a bit. Uh, you know that Henry Kissinger normally quotes said 50 years ago that There's no foreign policy, but only, uh, you know, internal policy. Everything that Israel has been doing in regard to other states or the international community <coughs> was calculated by domestic calculations and interests. Same here. Netanyahu gave actually the order, and this is something I would like to say and to, and to, to be very clear. Ben Gvir who is a clear-cut example of a Judeo-Nazi. He belongs to a Judeo-Nazi party. And, and, and I'm very frank about it, because his party, the so-called the religious Zionism, is a party with a Nazi agenda. Clear and, uh, uh, and simple. But he was accused by the police commissioner of Israel in being responsible for the whole mess that was going around in the last two weeks. Not someone from the left accused me in that. The police commissioner. I think is is is correct. That is not accurate, because Ben Gvir is a proxy of Netanyahu. Netanyahu is responsible by proxy to ignite the fire. He did it by. First of all, uh, uh, ordering the police to so in the Damascus Gate, a place where for many years youngsters, Palestinian young youngsters, during the Ramadan month, go there to sit on the stairs to talk and to break the fast, so they prevent uh, This was an order from above. It was not a strategic or tactic decision by the police. It was a political decision by Netanyahu. And thereafter, Netanyahu allowed the gangs, the thugs, that are closely related to this Nazi party that I mentioned, to stream the streets of Jerusalem, to uh, uh, mock and uh, uh, hit Palestinians, as well as leftists, by the way, in the streets of Jerusalem. So, this is another thing. Thirdly, he ordered uh, Benfield to go into Sheikh Jarrah 
into the most sensitive place within Sheikh Jarrah, which means by one of the central uh, robbed houses in which settlers live. And again, those settlers are the, the worst one could imagine, the worst racists and, uh, and uh, violent ones, and to build a tent as his chamber there. And on top of all those things, of course, came the invasion of the occupying forces into Al-Aqsa. There was no reason to do either of those, but, but only to ignite the area, the, the region. This is what Netanyahu wanted to do. And he wanted to do so once he lost the mandate to form a government. It, was, it is no a coincidence, it's not a coincidence, that all those deeds by Netanyahu <coughs> sorry, and everything that followed came more or less after the president of the state transformed the mandate for forming a government from Netanyahu to Lapid. So it is totally a consequence of internal crisis that Netanyahu himself has been going through. That's the only issue. And of course, the general picture is a picture of the occupation that Israel and, and a psychopath, a pyromaniac like Netanyahu, can do such things because Israel con uh, conducts an occupying regime, a military occupying regime, through uh, the Palestinian uh, uh, territories, including in Jerusalem. This is the general background. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, the pressure is increasing in Sheikh Jarrah. Uh, what is the importance of this neighborhood? And uh, you were personally victim of a brutal attack from the Israeli police uh, one month ago. What does Sheikh Jarrah mean in this policy? Look, first of all, Sheikh Jarrah, uh, one has to understand, uh, in short, the, the, the arguments about Sheikh Jarrah and the history of Sheikh Jarrah. First of all, it's a neighborhood in the east part of uh, Jerusalem, in occupied Jerusalem. So the occupying regime holds to the uh, people of Sheikh Jarrah as well, Palestinians one, the Palestinian people there. Now, the story is as follows, and I tried to this neighborhood 100 years ago, uh, the Jordanian government uh, actually uh, gave those houses, not for free, but, you know, politically speaking, for those families to live there. Most Palestinians are refugees. They were deported from their uh, uh, houses in the western part of Jerusalem where Israel took control and also from other cities within the state of Israel which were precise cities that were in Palestine and in western uh, uh, control uh, of the, uh, the state of Israel uh, uh, the beginning of its stay of a uh, not more or less in the beginning after it was established in, during the war of uh, 48 and the Nakba. So those Palestinians are refugees, they had houses in Lud and Ramle and western part of Jerusalem. And they were accommodated there, as I said before, by the Jordanian government. Once Israel uh, occupied this area, it is under a uh, uh, occupying regime, as I said before, and uh, in the for about 15 years. Settler fam uh, uh, families of settlers and different uh, right uh, extreme right wing uh, associations uh, began to could take control over some houses in the neighborhood to accommodate uh, Jewish families and to expel the Palestinians who live there. Now they present it as if it was a real estate issue. It's not a real estate issue. It is a political national issue because Israel uses the occupying rules in order to expel the indigenous people, the Palestinian indigenous people there, and accommodate instead of them. We are not talking about good neighbors. 
We're talking about those who would, wouldn't like to be neighbors. They would like to live there instead of the original inhabitants. And they, and they do it uh, gradually for about 15 years now. And the demonstrations, our demonstrations against this invasion and uh, theft uh, by those settlements and their uh, supporters and by uh, the encouragement and support of the governments, uh, our demonstrations have been going on for about 12 years. Now, what, we, what the Palestinians say, and I want you to understand that because that goes to the apartheid system of the state of Israel vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. Those settlers say that those neighborhoods belong to Jews because Jews lived there 100 years ago, 80 years ago, doesn't matter. There are two very important answers to that. Political ones, because as I said before, it's not an issue of property. It's an issue, it's a political issue, although we know the property is a political issue, but you know what I mean in that respect. So, one is the Palestinians there say, look, we are the descendants of Palestinian refugees who were deported from their houses in Lud, Ramla, and western part of Jerusalem. If you argue that the Jews have the right to go back to their houses because they were deported from there 100 years ago, so we just do the same with us. Let us go back to our houses in the western part of Jerusalem, Lud and Ramle. But in Israel, there is this apartheid racist law that allows only Jews to get back property they lost throughout the, uh, during different wars in the area. It doesn't go for Palestinians. It's one-sided. Mm -hmm. This is one thing. The other thing uh, is that those, or at least the vast majority of those Jews who want to live in the middle of the Palestinian neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah, they have no connection personally, personal connection to those houses. The only argument, if you like, if you like to call it an argument, is that because they are Jews, and those who lived there 100 years ago were Jews, it means that they have the right to continue their, uh, uh, uh, uh, to live in their property uh, and uh, to continue their ownership, as it were, which, is, which resembles too much things that happened in Germany 90 years ago, I'm afraid to say. So this is, and because of that, Sheikh Sharach became a symbol of a Palestinian struggle for liberation in general and for liberation from the apartheid in East Jerusalem in particular. It doesn't mean that, there are, that, this, that similar problems do not exist in other places. In other places, including in Jerusalem, in occupied Jerusalem, like Silwan, there are similar uh, uh, po uh, problems. But Sheikh Jarrah became a symbol because of what I said before. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's another point I'd like to ask. Uh, some Jewish fascists uh, attacked some Arabs on the streets. Uh, this is not common. Uh, this was not common, at, uh, maybe, in the past. What does this mean? Uh, is a civil war possible, like some Israelis say? <coughs> Look, I have to be very, very... Uh, we, have, we have to be very uh, uh, precise and accurate here. They were pogroms and lynches by Jews against Arabs and by Arabs against Jews. Mm -hmm. And this is something that Netanyahu encouraged and was interested in that because that leads to an instability that he only has, have, well, out, he can profit from that, okay? It's not a coincidence, but there's no symmetry for at least two reasons. One is that pogroms and lynches and torches, etc., by Jews against Palestinians is an, a, those are atrocities by the majority against the minority. The minority is under risk everywhere, much more than the majority. So this is one thing why the pogroms uh, against the uh, Palestinian citizens in Israel are much more dangerous than the other way around, although of course we are against each and every act of those lynches and violence, to be, to be clear. Another reason, which is no less important, is that the, uh, the violence that came 
from uh, Arab Palestinian citizens was not organized, definitely not from above. It was carried out mostly by uh, organized crime and by alienated and frustrated youngsters. Normally, it was carried out on the spot, okay? Mm -hmm. It was not organized as a political means to something or as a political endeavor. But in the case of lynches, torches, and violence, and pogroms by Jews against Arab Palestinians, this was organized from above. So I said it was organized from above, again, by Judeo-Nazis like Ben Gvir, who encouraged people to go to the streets. And more than that, uh, Amir Ohana, who is the Minister for Internal Security, is a puppet of Netanyahu. He st was standing, he stood in front of the public on the television and every and the media in general and said he called upon the Jews to go with arms in the streets and he also said don't worry if you do something we are going to do whatever we can to prevent you from being trialed and Netanyahu said the same in that sense from the very uh, uh, uh, above from up there from Netanyahu, who is government, especially this minister, they actually legitimized the uh, pogroms against Arabs. So in that sense, this is very, very important for the people to know. This is what turned it to be very, very dangerous, because it is part of the state apparatus, not just in sporadic individuals. This is those sporadic individuals who actually carried out the pogroms were encouraged to do so and legitimized by the state apparatus. And the police itself hardly arrested any, any Jew who attacked Palestinians, but not the other way around. I'll give you numbers. About 1,443, I think, people were arrested for lynches and violence. Among those 1,400 and something, only 150 are Jews. Mm -hmm. That's the picture. It's because there is a, a discrimination and a racial discrimination, and this is just one of the of any, one indication about a, a, of many. So you began to ask something about the missiles, I think. The, the, the missile attacks from the Gaza Strip was yeah, initiated by Hamas. What can be the intention of Hamas with these uh, attacks? Because uh, they have also been lo losing some ground among the Palestinians so, recently. First of all, here too, I want to be very clear that we reject any uh, shooting of uh, at uh, citizens and we regard them as a war crime to be to start with. Now it is true that Hamas began shooting the missiles, but it, it, it didn't begin just because just for fun. It was encouraged by Netanyahu, as I said before, with his, uh, and I said it, you know, many times, very uh, uh, uh, straightforwardly. He ignited the fire in order to prevent. <coughs> he ignited the fire by uh, those atrocities that I mentioned before. He was interested in this fire. He actually led the Hamas to shoot. Very, I know that I am, uh, I, I'm saying here things that are very strong words, but I mean each and one of them. I'm sure, I'm positive that Netanyahu wanted the missile to be shot by the Hamas in order to divert the attention from the political chaos from the, uh, the trial that Netanyahu is facing, from his failure, from his continuing failure to form a government, to issues of war, security, and death. Mm -hmm. So the Hamas, unfortunately, collaborated with uh, Netanyahu because it had what, something to earn as well. There is an implicit pact between Netanyahu and Hamas. It's not a coincidence that at the same time that Netanyahu blocks 
the uh, uh, money and the budget of the Palestinian Authority, which is uh, uh, an authority that would like to carry negotiations with uh, Israel towards the Palestinian state and ending the occupation. Netanyahu and his government for many years has been blocking uh, the money and resources that the Palestinian Authority needs. On the other hand, Netanyahu continually uh, allows money from Qatar to go to Hamas. And some people say that not only from Qatar. And you may, may perhaps understand what I mean. Uh, so, because he wants two things in that. He wants uh, the right-wing Palestinians to get stronger because they oppose negotiations, and Netanyahu doesn't want negotiations. This is one thing. The other thing is that by, by, uh, by uh, strengthening the Hamas at the expense of the Palestinian Authority, Netanyahu keeps the cleavage between them, the Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, and he keeps the cleavage and the, and the internal conflict. He, this allows reconciliation within the Palestinians, and by that he also uh, uh, prevents negotiations and the uh, peaceful solution. <coughs> and uh, in that sense, Netanyahu has an interest in the uh, in escalation, and the Hamas has interest in escalation. And let's not forget that the, uh, just a while ago, Abu Mazen declared that there were going to be elections. And uh, he, uh, he cancelled them lately. And uh, the Hamas wanted the chance to get stronger and to appear as if it was the defender of holy, the Holy Mask in Jerusalem, etc. So there is, as I said before, an implicit, implicit pact between Netanyahu and the Hamas, although it is implicit. I don't say that they talk every day in order to coordinate their actions. I guess not. Mm -hmm. uh, although I, I may imagine something like that about Netanyahu because his cynicism is uh, something almost inhuman. But uh, I guess that it is more implicit than explicit. Mm -hmm. And uh, at first, uh, when the Israeli attacks started, there were reactions from the imperialist centers. But then, uh, when clashes uh, began to develop, uh, the USA and some European countries expressed support for Israel's policies. Uh, what will you say about the imperialist involvement uh, in the current situation? <coughs> Look, I, like, I, like always, the imperialist in, uh, intervention uh, is always in support of the, of the state of Israel. It's been like that uh, for ages, uh, ever since the, the, the establishment of the state. So there are no surprises in that uh, arena, you know. Nobody expected something else. But I, I must say something that um, is, a, is a source of optimism in my view. You can see that the, most, that the more progressive uh, part or fraction within the Democratic Party in the United States it got stronger and that they are more influential. You could see that the Bernie Sanders and the uh, Taliba, what is it, what's her name? Uh, I forgot the name. The, the, the, the, Ocasio-Cortez. Ocasio-Cortez. Ocasio-Cortez as well. Uh, but uh, the, the, there are another two. Uh, they uh, began to, uh, I, I wouldn't like to call it pressure, I don't think that they did, but they did say something or indicated to Biden things like that cannot uh, continue. Uh, I could see the tweets uh, and public statements by those uh, progressive uh, senators. They were very encouraging. Uh, uh, Bernie Sanders uh, even offered a bill that would prevent, or at least to a great extent, in a, in, a, in a very radical way, will reduce the arms selling uh, or the uh, uh, uh, budget uh, that uh, uh, for using the to, for arms uh, from the United States uh, to Israel will be cut radically, will be reduced. And uh, so in that sense, I think that uh, there are some changes 
slow ones, gradual ones. But there are some changes within the United States as well. Socially, for sure, you can see more and more uh, demonstrations throughout the United States in support of the Palestinians and against Israeli atrocities and occupation. And at the same time, you can see that within the administration itself and the Congress, you can hear a very progressive voice that says, no more. And Biden must take those voices into account. He cannot ignore them. That's uh, why, by the way, so on the other hand, uh, sorry, on the one hand, he supported Israel and didn't do uh, at all anything to stop uh, the atrocities in Gaza and the missiles on Israel from the very beginning. He didn't. But uh, as days went by and the, uh, the pressure within his party grew stronger, he began to put a, a bit more pressure on Netanyahu. I think that the ceasefire, although it was reached much too late and too little, but it was reached uh, because of Biden. If Biden wouldn't have pressed Netanyahu, I'm afraid that the, uh, the, the, the escalation would have continued. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, imperialism is still here, it tries to intervene and supports the, uh, the state of Israel as a sort of an agent for imperialism, like always been, it's always been. On the other hand, you can see a gradual change within the United States that may uh, reduce the level of imperialism and who knows, perhaps even uh, eliminates the imperialism if, uh, you know, the progressives are got uh, into power. Hmm. I'm quite optimistic. Uh, and uh, a ceasefire was declared in the end. Uh, what will happen after this? How do you think things will develop? Source of each and every escalation that we see from time to time is the occupation, including the siege on uh, Gaza, of course. So I believe that in the short run, it's going to be relatively uh, quiet because it's, a, it's the interests of both sides at the moment, only at the moment. Mm -hmm. But if the occupation goes on, if the siege on, on, on Gaza goes on, obviously something like that and, and, and, and perhaps even worse is going to happen again. So it's the interest of the Palestinians, obviously, but also of the Israelis to put an end to the occupation and to the siege and to reach an agreed, agreeable uh, uh, and just peace uh, agreement. Mm -hmm. This is the, the, the only thing that will, pre that will prevent uh, such an escalation to, uh, from happening again. And this is what we are trying to, to do in our list, to uh, pursue to, uh, this specific, you know, this is our uh, platform, it's always been. And we'll continue. We shall never give up. It's not uh, easy. I personally, I, under uh, many uh, assassination threats, uh, I'm on my way now to a demonstration in Jerusalem. At the same time, in uh, 20 minutes, uh, some uh, fascists are uh, supposed to be in my house to demonstrate against me, calling to kill me as well. But we shall never give up. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Ofer, for sharing your opinions with us. And you are going through a my difficult pleasure. time. Uh, my best wishes to you in your struggle. Thank you very much, you too, and uh, good luck. Thank you. Evet, sevgili seyirciler, bir programın daha sonuna geldik. Bir sonraki programda görüşmek üzere.